up. So okay. yeah, that that was so embarrassing, but so funny at the same time. Like we were all so overtired. Like we thought it was hilarious. He was more like confused. I think he's like, "Why like, are you doing you that?" Doing? <laughs> Remember, the show is PG thirteen, so you might hear a naughty word or two. Canadian world medalist, Nebraska standout, Emma Spence is here to talk to us about her experiences at the pre-G7 peace voyage in Japan with FIG President Watanabe and the crazy things that Americans say to international students at Nebraska. I apologize for us, don't worry. We have a preview of continental championships, including Pan Am's, African. Japan chose their world team 300 years too early, as usual. We'll tell you about that. Chinese championships are happening now, and we have an important bars update for you on that. Plus, Kalia Namor is free from French gymnastics jail. So we'll tell you about that as well. This is episode 19, the 19th episode for 2023. It's May 22nd. And welcome to the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy. I'm Jessica and I'm here with Spencer from the balance beam situation. Spencer, why is this weekend such a big deal for Paris? So we've got major Olympic qualifying implications happening in just just days, Jessica. Mere mere days from as we sit now. So for athletes from the Americas and Africa, this weekend's performances determine basically whether you stay in the mix because you have to then qualify from your continental championship this weekend to the world championships this year. And then this year's world championships are not the only, but definitely the best way to qualify to the Paris Olympics. And that's particularly true this year, because I think there is a lot of, in terms of the 2024 possible pathways, the apparatus world cups and things, there's a lot of fear that the Russian athletes by next year will be allowed to compete as like flagless unaffiliated individuals. And we'll just show up to all the, the apparatus world cups and just be like, all the spots are mine. We got them. And that's going to be their route to the Olympics. So I think a lot of athletes specifically don't want to rely on 2024 for their Olympic hopes. They want to get it done this year before yes. like Listunova and Melnikova show up and be like, oh, you thought you were going to get a floor spot? No, no, you're not because we're here. So um, I think that puts even more, like even higher stakes on the Continental Championships this year because people really want to get get to Worlds this year, get their yeah. spots sewn up, not have to deal with 2024. So for individuals, which is going to be our main focus for the African and continent or the African and Pan American championships. Jessica's very excited. Yes. They have to place high enough in the all around this weekend to make it to worlds. That's 11 spots from the Americas, four spots from Africa. So, you know, you show up to qualification this weekend, have an off day, your options to make the Olympics become very limited. So we'll start by talking about what's going on at the African championships. The big story is Kaylee and Amore. Jessica, do you want to give kind of a, Ref- quick refresher and an update. Kaylee Amor, who is she? Why is yes. this so important? Why is this the only thing we're talking and texting about in the entire world? Yes, of it's so exciting. Okay, so uh, first of all, why should you care about her? And why is this a name that everyone is going to be saying? Because she's a no. human being, Jessica. <laughs> why should we care about her? Come Because she matters. Okay, she is currently the highest scoring bar worker in the world, which means she got a 15.35 on bars. That's a 6.8 uh, D score and 8.55 E score. It's Her bars are stunningly beautiful, and you will fall in love with her the second you watch. And a reminder, you can watch along with us um, on the uh, YouTubes if you'd like to watch this episode. Um all she has the all time mega connection 0.7 elements for a 0.8 uh credit value, <laughs> which is seven elements. Point seven, seven elements. elements. Oh, did I say 0.7 <laughs> elements, seven <laughs> elements connected. That's us trying to do a bars routine, a whole 0.7 <laughs> elements. <laughs> seven. I oh, tried a kip, <laughs> <laughs> stub of a kip. Yeah. So, yes, she does elements. in bar chaposh to yeah. a stalter full. Uh-huh. Two Stalter Takachev half. This is all connected, by the way. That's the Durwell yeah. Fenton. Two Ayezhava, two Stalter Shaposh to pack to Van Leeuwen. 
all connected. Has she heard of Kips? No. She no. Did, she... And that's that's how you bars. That's how you get the score on bars. Don't Kip. No handstands. Because you're right. just going to get a million deductions. And you get some a ton of bonus. It's perfect. It's the smartest and most difficult bars construction being done. And that's why it's well, and she has beautiful form too. Um, so this is why she's such a big deal and why we're talking about her so much. So she wanted to change her nationality to Algeria. So the FIG approved an, her nationality change. FIG was like, yeah, of course, but France wouldn't release her. You know, this is where I want the institution of my colonizer rule. Like, you can't have mm-hmm. a say if you want to colonize. So the thing is that if your federation doesn't approve, you have to wait a year to compete for under your new nationality, which means she'd miss the African championships, which means she'd miss probably her ability to qualify to Worlds and then her, you know, maybe ability to qualify to Paris. That's why it's so important. So last week... This is the thing. We were like, did they do this? We talked about this, all about this on Behind the Scenes this week. <laughs> and uh, we were like, did they just do this out of the goodness of their hearts? Because the French are in deep, deep crap right now. They're having their comeuppance time like Canada is, like the U.S. went through. It's the time for France. So the consequences are coming down on them hard. So last week, the head of the French Federation and the technical director were summoned to a meeting with the French Minister of Sport. Yes. So the French Federation suddenly agreed to release Namor so she can now compete for Algeria just in time for the African Championships. It was like nine days or something, 10 days before the African Championships. Which is also stressing me out a lot because I'm like, it's past the registration deadline. Where is your FIG license going to come through? I have so many logistical sweats. I just, I have, I have, I have the documentation sweats, and which is a very, you know, a common ailment in the gymnastics world. The documentation sweats, and this is giving me, it's giving me a bad case. The good thing is, documentation and paperwork is the easiest part of doing the best bar routine in the entire world. So hopefully Mm. the FIG was obviously closely watching this. And I feel like they stepped on some, they used their powers for good a little bit here. um, And probably were like, you guys don't want this. So um, also the, the reason I think that like the, this is, it's such a big deal. And I just want to go into what's happening in France a little bit. Um, and why it's why I think the French minister of sport was like, this is the least of your problems. Let her compete is because um, the French Federation, as I said, is going through their consequences time. And so according to Le Monde, um, the French Federation is now in the middle of an abuse investigation that was publicly broadcast. So a bunch of athletes testified, gymnasts testified um, about physical, verbal abuse and being forced to compete on broken bones, um, told to lose six pounds in one week. And what is this wrestling? They, it's basically the stuff that we've heard all over the place that happens. Um, the French Federation, I want to mention, has hired multiple coaches despite abuse allegations, known published abuse allegations. So, for example, they hired Vitaly Marinich, who was the former U.S. Uh, men's head coach at the OTC. He was fired after the Legendres came forward on this very show um, and accused him of sexual assault. And then it was found out that Steve Penny knew all about this. And shortly thereafter, after their interview aired, Marinich was fired, and then Steve Penny was also forced to step down from USA Gymnastics. Um, he was the former president of USA Gymnastics. Marinich was then hired by the French, and then he was fired for drunken misconduct um, towards uh, female staff members. Uh, the French Federation then hired Eric DeMay, who, who is French, who was accused of abuse uh, by gym- gymnast not in one country, not in two countries, but in three countries. So Eric DeMay was accused by Keslin in Switzerland when he was a coach there, accused by two gymnasts in Mexico, including Elsa Garcia, and gymnasts in France. But somehow it took this investigation 
and the public pressure being front, put on the French Federation for them to actually ban uh, Eric DeMay. So the French Federation, if they're saying, and the president, if he's saying he actually supports gymnasts, then maybe they need to listen to gymnasts the first time that they talk about abuse by these coaches, and they need to actually do their due diligence before hiring people again. Okay, Spencer, back to African championships yes. and why this is so yes. important. So, as, men as I mentioned, four all-around spots are available for Worlds this year at African Championships. Uh, women compete this Friday, men compete this Saturday. Um, so there's one team spot as well. Um, we expect that to come down to either South Africa or Egypt for the women. Could be really close. Last year, Egypt hosted and won when South Africa had a lot of uh, falls on beam. This year, South Africa is hosting in Tishwane. And um, I don't know who's competing for Egypt yet. I haven't seen an official list that will, I think, be de determinative for Egypt because we saw they just had the Cairo World Cup, which we talked about. We talked about Joss Robertson, who was there and um, won a bunch of medals. A lot of the top Egyptian women were not there, which was kind of surprising to me because it was the Cairo World Cup. It's their home world event. So I'm interested to see whether they were just like, there's actually not able to compete or it's one of those like pff, call me call me when it counts like this is just a, this is just a world cup call me when it's the continental <laughs> championship so that will be interesting uh last year when egypt got the spot then south africa got two individual all-arounders algeria got two individual all-arounders probably that's what you'd favor this time as well whatever country doesn't get the team spot two and then algeria can get two kalia namor would be heavily favored as long as she vaults she doesn't always doesn't typically compete vaults she has vaults um but you know her bar score we expect it to be so large that and she's also excellent on beam so which we don't talk about as much because it's not like the 15-3 but you know we would expect that if she's there competing healthy able to do the all-around she would get one of those four available all-around spots yeah i'm very excited for this um Okay, so but we also look at Rose one Krantz, thing. who's going to be competing there too. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, Rose Krantz. South Africa's sending a really good team. Rose Krantz, Darius, um, Shanta Koti, who I saw at the Commonwealth Games last year for the first time, and I was like, college teams, watch, look, look, <laughs> college teams, look at this floor performance. I know this is whatever about the skills. Look at how she's performing on floor. So she's going to be on um, South Africa's team again this year, and that's very exciting. The thing about Namur having the highest bar score in the world i do want to say is pending ongoing chinese championships which are happening which are ongoing this week because chu chi yen trains a 6-9 difficulty score so perhaps in 15 seconds after we record that may not be the highest no more might not have the highest bar score anymore but as of right now as of this recording but yeah, we're going to look at that and talk about that routine in a minute. Uh, okay, so let's yeah. talk about Pan Am Championships because they're happening this weekend. USAG mm -hmm. will have all the how to watches up for you guys so you can follow them. Their social media person is doing such a good job. I just want to give that is one of the best things that's come out of the dumpster fire of rebuilding the Phoenix. I, the Phoenix is their social media person is the Phoenix of USA Gymnastics. <laughs> I want to give her all the credit because she does such a good job. Okay, so... The, which women's teams are going to be there? Yeah, so all of the major countries are sending uh, teams. Because the Pan American countries had such a good world championships this year, or last year, most of the top countries don't have a lot riding on this. So for the women, U.S., Canada, Brazil already qualified to Worlds because they made the team final at 2022 Worlds, so they're already qualified to 2023. Also, the U.S. and Brazilian men already qualified so we will see those countries not send total full strength some of them are like u.s men are sending you know yule moldauer is on the list shane whiskus is on the list um but you know u.s women i think sending the best team that's currently competing elite right now that they had at the yeah. selection camp but you know shylise jordan Childs, jade carey suny like there's 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 some other gymnasts <laughs> waiting in the wings who are in college or doing other things you know um and canada and brazil like not, ellie black's not going for canada shellen olsen's not going for brazil andrade's not going Sariva's not going so they are very much those teams were selected knowing you guys we already made it to worlds 
great opportunity yeah. for experience, but like we have nothing, nothing riding on this. What's really the big deal, once again, is the individual, the quest for individual yes! Olympic qualification. My because favorite. there are a lot of gymnasts um, who are trying at Pan Ams to get to Worlds to then get to the Olympics. Namely, uh, well, actually, there are a lot of namelys. Lindsey Brown, who has now her license to represent Haiti internationally. She is on the list going for a spot at at Worlds this this weekend. Yes. Um, I want to say, someone asked who's Lindsey Brown, and I was like, excuse me? How do you not know who <laughs> Lindsey Brown is? Uh, so Lindsey Brown is a Denver gymnast. Uh, she's from the United States uh, of Haitian descent and um, has competed for Denver and is known as like one of the most positive, lovely people on earth. She is also one of the most resilient human beings ever, ever, I think. Uh, she has lost her mother during college, has torn all her Achilles, um, and is has come back from everything stronger and remains like an absolutely uh, beautiful person. And that is hard to do after so much um, trauma. So that's who Lindsey Brown is. Also was on Simone's, was chosen for Simone's goat tour, even though she wasn't up to full strength tumbling wise because she can dance and because she's a like amazing person. And that's the kind of person you want on tour with you. So that's who Lindsey Brown is. In case you didn't know, sub we love tweet her. to whoever asked you who Lindsey Brown is. <laughs> sub tweet Just out there. You. Rant. <laughs> <laughs> so I think yeah. what's interesting is looking at this, how a college gymnast adapts their routines for competing elite. Because we know like gymnastics ability wise just like put lindsey brown to worlds right now like that's not it's yeah. not a question but how do you adapt those routines or you know dig into your like old toolbox to find skills that you haven't done since you were a level 10 but like that would work for elite um so i was looking at last year's results from pan ams it took last year like an all-around score in the high 44s to qualify for to worlds out of pan ams i think it's going to be higher this year i think it's a deeper and stronger group but that's not an unattainable all-around score by any means even if Lindsey brown were to compete just her like her college routines which often don't translate to the elite code because of composition requirements and because of the different you yeah. know you're missing out on a lot of things that you could you know add in an a b or c skill to fix but you don't need to because of your college routine but you know High 44, like Lindsey Brown's total D score from her college routines would be a 15.2, mostly in the threes, mostly because of compositional things. She would then only need to average a 7.4 E score to hit that high 44 mark, which I'm like, that's very doable with hits. Totally so doable. it's like, you could just do your college routines if that's what's most comfortable and probably get a score. But also then, you know, you have to hit, it's maybe making it, you know there's more pressure on hitting. But if you were to add, you know, like a blind full on bars and get five tenths in composition requirement that you wouldn't have otherwise, there are some pretty straightforward or seemingly straightforward to, you know, for, for gymnasts of this level fixes that you could add a lot to your, to your routine. So basically what I'm saying is once again, as we've established, I am a huge dork for the code <laughs> And the thing I'm most interested to see is like, oh, but what are you adding to do your composition requirements to do this skill? Like that is more exciting to me than like sports. So that's what that's what I'm that's what I'm watching. And I'm like, I'm so happy for her. And they yeah. did everything just in the nick of time. And they saved the spot for her. So her license would come through <laughs> and they did it. And everyone on the gym internet helped her get in touch with the right people to get her license done. And oh, it's a beautiful story. But also just be... has tears in her eyes uh, basically i see i see a tear i see an oncoming tear in her eye yeah Lindsay could show up and just do a dance through on floor and jessica would be like this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened in the history of gymnastics speaking of dance throughs i'm super excited to see sydney barros uh competing for puerto rico who's a great dancer and doesn't waste mm -hmm. a floor routine with elite nonsense she's not gonna get any artistry deductions so watch her routine uh yeah yeah, she's another who, if we haven't seen her compete in full, like full all around in quite a while, but Since her Olympic level last, 
Yeah, Olympic tr- no, was well, it she did cup? she did some stuff that, like she'll show up at a Woga Classic, you know yeah. that. But we haven't seen a full like all around competition. Um, but last time we saw her do that, we were like so far and way above the level you would need to qualify for Worlds. So it's just exciting to see, you know. Yep. what she brings in the race to qualify for the Olympics um, representing Puerto Rico. And we talked about, it must have been like a year ago when she changed her um, FIG affiliation. Mm-hmm. And that was a situation, unlike, you know, Kelia Nemour, where she was immediately able to compete for Puerto Rico because no one was being a little jerk about it. And it was just like, yes, you Algeria, can your affiliation. Algeria, not Puerto Rico, but yes. Oh, sorry. Nemour, Algeria, Sydney Barros, Puerto Rico. Right. And we're excited because you can see even more amazing dance from her uh, because she's going to be going to UCLA, who has a full-time choreographer, as everyone should. Also, we noticed that Anya Pilgrim, standout Mm -hmm. as a junior elite, is now Mm -hmm. uh, competing for Barbados. So she's going to be there, too. And she's also one of the gymnasts who just compete, who's competing here internationally and also just competed in um, the Dev National Championships, like Level 10 National Championships here in the United States, along with Annalise newman Um, So she just competed two weeks ago at Nationals, and she's going to Florida in 2024. So, mm-hmm. and yeah, very excited to watch her, too. Yeah, I think that's going to be, she's going to be one of the big, the gym that's like in what is it, seven months' time, who, like, the internet is talking about a lot, and who Bart and Kathy have a lot to say about, like, Anya Pilgrim. Yes. Just get ready for it now, because I think the Florida ha- the Florida fans all need to already get their plans together for, like, Pilgrim hats. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. themed, you know... A turkey on your Anya head, Pilgrim maybe. Yes. ...plans to prepare for how into her they're going to be is what I'm saying. You've got to plan yeah. these things months in advance because otherwise it's just haphazard. And we'll talk about Canadian nationals in a minute. So yeah, you mentioned Annalise uh, competing for Trinidad and Tobago. She is going to be at Cal next year. She was the one also remember the whole bars debacle at Commonwealth games where she needed to raise it higher than the level the FIG had said you were allowed to raise it. Yada, yada, yada. Um, so they finally changed the rule. Thanks to her, because and then it was okay, higher, yeah. but we won't let you. Yeah, so right. thanks to and her, it was okay at Worlds. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the note of gymnasts who have at times or also compete domestically in the United States in some way, did you see the uh, nominative list for the Asian Championships and both? Emma Malabuyo and Aaliyah Finnegan listed for the Philippines, and I was like. Very excited, but is this real? <laughs> or is this just wishful thinking? Right, because I was like, wait, do they even have their FIG licenses? And also, aren't they like doing camps right now? I was like, is this really happening? I think sometimes the Phil- the Pil- Philippines does like a, in case we- you didn't feel pressured, we're going to put you on the nominative roster <laughs> um, to make sure you show up. But maybe the gymnast hasn't decided if they're going to do that yet. And this is the thing, nominative rosters are just, you know, nominative rosters. Right. You don't know. But it's like, oh, is that, I didn't even know that was one of the choices. Like, Emma Malibuyo competing internationally for the Philippines. Like, Aaliyah Finnegan has done that before. So I was like, yes, that's on the table. I didn't even know that was on the table for Malibuyo. Yeah. I mean, do you think maybe they go through the list? The Philippines is like, let's look for Filipino last names of the U.S. gymnasts and choose and reach out. That's what I would do, honestly. Uh, but yeah, it's exciting. I mean, Malibu. We, so we shall see. But yeah, that would be very exciting. So, uh, when's the meet start? How do we watch? What are we looking for? We haven't talked about the yes. U.S. team yet. We will. We will. I All was right, talking about like the the important stuff because the that, there's of nothing writing. Being there's accurate. nothing writing yeah. on this for it's just the for, U.S. women. Yeah, team. It's, it's for fun and experience know. for the other the big teams essentially. Um, so, but Pan American Championships this weekend, men on Friday, women on Saturday, scheduled to stream on the Pan Am Sports Channel, which is where it has streamed in the past. They have it on the website, at least, which is, you know, a- above, a- already above and beyond for gymnastic streams. Like, it's on the website more than a minute in advance. We're we're doing great. Uh, so, yes, U.S. women's team named after they had a camp verification to select Jocelyn Robertson, Addison Feta, Tiana Sumanasekara, 
Nola Matthews, Zoe Miller, and then Madre Johnson is the traveling alternate. I said nothing's at stake for the U.S. women. What I will say is I think the general impression has been that once the big names who are intending to compete elite this year return to compete, there won't be like world's team contention opportunities for the gymnasts who are on the Pan Am's team. So I do think this competition is an opportunity for this group of gymnasts who are going to Columbia for this competition to say, eh, bet, bet, bet. we are competitive. We do have the scores that are going to continue to challenge for a spot on the world's team, even when the name brands are competing. So I think that's for the individual gymnasts, like there's something, there's something to prove here. And as a team, I'm looking at the team score, the top team scores that we've seen so far this year. So yeah. Italy at Yesolo got a 164.9. And that was a healthy-ish Italy with Asia D'Amato. So, you know, um, Great Britain at Euros also got into the 164s. The U.S. women's team that competed um, at the DTB Cup in Stuttgart earlier this year got a 162. So that's a little bit lower than, and you know, that's a pretty full strength British team that competed at European Championships. Um, it's a little bit lower. I think that a good goal for this team would be to get into that 164s and get closer to the level that we've seen from the top teams. Um, from other countries this year, if they're going to make that argument of, I could be on a world's team. I have this score and don't overlook me, even though yeah. famous other people. I think like, you know, we have like the name brand, you know, very experienced seniors who are were in college. So they're not going for teams right now. They're going to wait till worlds. Um, but what's cool about this is like, we have people like Robertson who's gone to like every world cup there is like, has she even been home in like months? Feta <laughs> and Nola who are, have been competing really consistently this year and aren't broken. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. So shout out to them, coaches, everybody that is, you know, keeping them healthy to be able to compete so much. And now they have so much experience. I mean, can you name any gymnast of the name brand variety except for Jade Carey who's been <laughs> to this many meets in a year? Like, it's good that they I are competing, competing, competing. Pretty, competing. yeah, I mean, it is usual that, like, Robertson going to the Cairo World Cup. Like, we didn't see that in, you know flashback five years ago or so we weren't right. seeing athletes go to world cups i mean the stuttgart team competition they'll typically they didn't go send seniors to yes solo this year but the u.s typically does so you know they're getting the normal spring competitions but yeah i know i think we've seen that in the consistency of those the athletes that are on um this year's pan-american team that previously they maybe weren't the most reliable gymnasts and we're seeing m hits much more commonly from most of them yeah. i would say so we're looking at for them to score like higher than a 162 a 160 i think that'll be the, i mean 160. 162 will win this competition yeah so it's not that's not for like winning but i think that would be like a 164 would be a really good accomplishment be, yeah. for the group that would be a big deal. Um, but yeah, like I said, you know, Canada's not sending the absolute highest scores. Brazil's not sending the absolute highest scores. Still a good team, though, like Julia Suarez, who we liked on um, the world's mm -hmm. team last year, is going. Um, but so they should still, you know, score among the top. But I think the U.S. would be heavy favorites. Mexico needs to qualify a women's team to world still. They're sending a very good team. I think they should do that. Alexa Moreno was on the list, who we haven't seen compete, I think, since the Olympics. Um, yeah. So they're bringing, bringing out the ringers. Um, Atsiri Sandoval, it's an experienced team with good scoring potential. So I like Mexico's chances. Argentina was the other women's country that got a spot last year. So I'd say they'd come in as the favorites, but Colombia's not going to be that far behind. And they're the host team. So they're one to keep an eye on. Um, do you think if there's a team that's going to wipe the floor with everybody, even though it's not the, the A team for everyone, like Brazil, right. do you expect them to win? And are we going to see battle bars between Suarez and Zoe Miller? Suarez is not much of a bars gymnast. I would say beam. What was floor, I thinking? Beam. Suarez oh, beam, beam, beam. That's right. Who am I thinking from Brazil? Who's not, who's not there that I'm thinking is there. Uh, Rebecca, Andrade? Andrade? Is that, is that, <laughs> she's kind of good. <laughs> Have you heard of her? Maybe you're thinking of Rebecca Andrade, who, who would win. Yes. Would she wipe the floor with everyone at this meet if she were competing? It yes, was, she would. But she is not. 
<laughs> I was thinking of a not Andrade person, yeah. but out of, I was thinking of Beam. Okay, so uh, it's Chinese nationals right now. Right now. Happening as Suddenly. we record. Yeah. Yes. We're mid-competition. So next week we'll talk about it, talk about it in terms of what actually happened in finals. We've seen qualification so far. The big news out of qualification is Chu Chi Yen, who leads the all around and bars and beam. And on beam, she's performing, wait for it, back handspring Arabian as her acro series. Yes. I am so excited and so scared. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so good though. I mean, watching her do this is like, it's so solid. I'm not worried at all. Totally you solid. You aren't? <laughs> no, I'm not worried. She doesn't land very high. I mean, she's no Nia Dennis doing or Reagan Corville doing an Arabian, but she's doing it out of a back handspring and it's she's landing, you know, it's in combination. That's the thing. And she would, should be easier to get power from. But, you know, she's landing a little low, but it's, like, very solid. I'm really impressed because, you know, an Arabian in combination is terrifying. More terrifying than an Anodi. I don't know. It depends how much you don't mind splitting the beam but on your on your legs versus splitting the beam with your head coming onto the beam first. That's what I think about it. But, yeah. Uh, Chu Chi's pretty badass, and I'm excited. I also love her leotard. So, bonus for that yeah we're very excited about that she also brought back her layout jaeger on bars so she's doing ling to layout jaeger and she got a six five in qualification but you know there's more connections she could do in terms of her d score so that's very exciting um yeah we're gonna keep an eye on her in the all around and event finals yep her use of flexion and extension on beam two is something i appreciate but her layout jaeger is like, oh, that's what it's supposed to... You want to get credit? Oh, you can tell it's yeah. a layout from three miles away? Oh, it's perfect? Yes. So, excited to watch that. Club Gym Nerd. Get discounts and first dibs on live show tickets and extra podcasts every week. Athlete dossiers, code guides, commission your own segments of the show. It also makes a great gift. Check it out at gymcastic.com at the Join the Club tab. Now it's time to hear from our guest, Emma Spence. She is a gymnast at the University of Nebraska. She is a Canadian. She was on the bronze medal winning team uh, for Canada last year in Liverpool at World Historic bronze medal for that team um and she re recently went to japan at the invitation of fig president watanabe on a peace mission with other gymnasts ahead of the g7 uh conference which is happening this week so let's talk to emma yeah so we actually had like a conference with the prime minister of japan so that was a crazy experience everyone was we were honestly kind of nervous we didn't want to do anything wrong we didn't want to mess anything up like that was a big deal for us um, so we met the prime minister of Japan. We met the mayor and the governor of Hiroshima when we went to go see, visit Hiroshima as well. So that was also a pretty big deal. We had, um, we listened to them speak a little bit. There was a lot of media, there were press conference that we had to do with them too. So those are like the top three, I guess, biggest people that we talked to, but we also were spending the whole time with the fig president. So that also like, I thought that was pretty crazy in itself. Like the first night I get there. And they messaged me like the big president wants to invite you to dinner. Um, are you able to attend? I was like, oh, my gosh, like, is this real life? Yeah. Like, I was just the whole time I was there, I was around so many big names and big people. And not to mention just the athletes themselves. Like, I was definitely fangirling a little bit. Um, being around like Nastia, Kohei, Mai, like that was everything was just an amazing experience. Like being around those people and just learning so much from them was crazy did they give you any kind of like etiquette like class before you started your experience there i'm always terrified to offend everyone in japan because i'm like i just okay. exist i'm offending someone here i have a really funny story it's actually really embarrassing but i will tell you because it's really funny so no we didn't really we, we weren't really told much but the one night this is the first night that we got invited to have the dinner with the fig president and I was sitting beside him at this dinner and he had a couple of his friends with him. And then it was me, Catherine, 
Lorette and Nastia. And we were, we just flew in this day. Like we were very tired. We were jet lagged, like, and it was probably like eight or nine o'clock at night at this Mm. point. So it was a really long day for us. And they had these bowls on the table. Um, and like they served us bread. So we just assumed these bowls had oil in them. (laughs) So I'm sitting beside the big president and we're like, we're very hungry. And the food they were serving was like little portions of like seafood. And it was kind of like a fancy restaurant. So we were starving and Nasty's like, I think this is oil. I was like, okay, like that makes sense. Like for us, they have oil on the table when they give us bread. So she dips it and like dips the bread in this bowl. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I think it's oil. So he's like, okay, I'll do the same thing. And then he looks over as I'm dipping this bread um, in this bowl and he grabs my wrist and he looks at me. He's like, no, 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 don't do that. This is for washing your hands. (laughs) So I'm like, (laughs) Like the big president just grabs my wrist and drops the bread out of my hand. And that was the first night. I was like, wow, off to a great start. I'm, I got caught dipping my bread in a hand washing bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that was so embarrassing, but so funny at the same time. Like we were all so overtired. Like we thought it was hilarious. He was more like, confused i think he's like why are you doing doing? that (laughs) (laughs) and then like two minutes later so like the waiter comes over he's speaking japanese to the waiter and then they come back with butter for us it was so funny (laughs) oh oh, oh. it was like these confused people can you get them some western stuff right now (laughs) yeah Um, so yeah that we didn't really know much that that was the first night um and then we were just a little bit more careful after that, we made sure to watch what other people were doing before we tried to do something ourselves. Last year at Liverpool World, you spoke at the Safeguarding Symposium that was hosted by the FIG during Worlds. How did that all come together? Yeah, so I'm part of the FIG Safeguarding Working Group. That's a group that started probably about two years ago now. I had to apply for that. They have about 15 gymnasts from around the world that are active or retired athletes. Uh, that I guess we meet about once a month. Now it's about every two months, depending on what projects we're working on. And we come up with things to change or that we think needs change to improve the culture of gymnastics. So some things we've done is we actually reworked the code of conduct for FIG. Uh, We came up with the 10 golden rules of gymnastics, which is, um, I guess, just the main things we want people to focus on, especially kids growing up in the sport. So we have, we came up with posters with graphics and the little sayings that went with each, I guess, move or thing we were talking about. Uh, and then we had a webinar last year, probably around this time, I think it's last June, a worldwide webinar talking about the importance of safeguarding and things you can do if you're in an abusive situation, how to handle it, um, information for coaches. It was just a very informative webinar that we put on for anyone in the world, coaches, judges, athlete, parents anyone that wanted to listen to it. And I guess that's kind of what got me selected for this opportunity at Worlds. Uh, They told me that I did a really good job speaking at this webinar and getting my ideas and points across in a way that people understood really well, because I think it was very hard. Also, because we do have people from around the world, so there is a little bit of a language barrier. So sometimes it's harder to understand. Some people, even though they have good ideas, it's just a little bit more difficult to understand just because of the language barrier. So they said I was very good. Like they were able to understand me very well. And I was very passionate about what I was saying. And that was very obvious. And I just did a really good job at speaking about those topics. So they selected me to go to Worlds to speak at this fake safeguarding conference. And that was the first time they actually had a conference like that happening. But they said that British Gymnastics wanted to partner with FIG to start advertising that because of everything that's happened in their past as well. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, they before asked me if you I made the go. team. This was like probably about two months before Worlds. I didn't even know if I was going to, it might have been longer, it might have been three, three months before Worlds. I didn't even know if I was going to try for Worlds at this point. Yeah, basically, the, even if I wasn't going to go to Worlds, they were going to fly me out just to do this conference, like fly me out to England to speak at this conference at Worlds. And then, like, that's what I would do there. So, we were prepping for that for about a, probably a month and a half, everything that was going to happen, who else was going to speak there. Like, it was the first time 
that we actually all got together too, all of those panelists, Danusia, Andrea Radikan, and Pagan. And we all spoke at that conference together. But yeah, then I ended up going to Worlds too. And that was also kind of a last minute thing. And we ended up making finals, which we also weren't sure we were going to do. And that ended up being the morning of finals. So I was like, you know what? Why not? I can, I can do it. I'll do both. And I think I had probably three, four hours in between both events. So I made it work and it was good. And honestly, it was probably good because I wasn't stressing too much about the meet because I had to do this big, important conference right before. So I was just focusing on that. And then once that was over, I got back to the hotel. I was like, okay, hair, makeup, and off to the meet. And that's kind of how it went. It was good. It was kind of crazy. but And everyone's telling me I was crazy for doing it. But I'm really glad I got to do it. And then the way that the meet went afterwards, it was just such an amazing way to end that day. So I wanted to go back to the safeguarding conference and just ask, what is, um, what is your advice for someone that has based on your experience and working on that and, you know, people asking you questions in the audience and that kind of stuff. What is your advice for someone that either witnesses something, knows something's going on or for an athlete who is experiencing a violation of those rules? The biggest thing I would say, especially for witnesses is if you see something to speak up about it, because in so many different situations, there are of abuse that end up coming out. There have been so many people that have seen everything happen and just decided not to say anything. And that just becomes so harmful because the more people that see it, the more people that think it's okay and just let it slide. And then it just keeps hurting these athletes more and more. And it's just, it's so hard to stop it until one person finally speaks up about it. But by the time that's happened, usually there's been hundreds or thousands even people that have known that this has been going on and just haven't done anything so I think it's just so important to if you see something that you don't think is right to speak up about it and to try and get it stopped as soon as you can because the longer you stay quiet the more that the athletes are harmed were there any questions at that conference that surprised you or you still think about that came up like from the audience or topics one of them that was actually very hard was a mother had the mic and she was asking us what to do. She just found out that her daughter was being abused for a really long time. Um, The daughter just opened up to her about it and she was getting very emotional. She was crying like she couldn't finish her sentences. And this was like a probably 40 year old mother in the stands. And she was just obviously hurting so much because she wishes she could have done more to have prevented it and to have helped her daughter and just seeing the impacts I know that it has on an athlete but then also on the parent as well because sometimes it is hard for them to know what happened and sometimes the kids will hide it from them and there's just so many sides of it that like seeing that and everyone else being able to see how it hurts the families as well not just the individual athlete not that it was important for people to see that, but I think like it was definitely very hard for everyone to hear that. And it was very upsetting, but it just shows how real this issue is. So the fact that she was so emotional and you could tell how much she was hurting, like this was fresh to her and hearing us talking about this stuff made her more emotional was just, it just shows how real it is, I guess, and how much of an impact it can have on everyone. And I think that's also important for people to realize that it doesn't just impact the individual athlete, it impacts everyone else in their lives as well, because it just, it makes you unwell. Like overall, it hurts you and it's going to hurt you and everyone around you for a very long time. So that was very surprising. The fact that she was so emotional about it too, like, we were just having normal people ask like a basic question really. And then that was the last question that we ended on. And everyone was just, we honestly, we didn't really know how to answer it too. We all felt so bad, especially the people that were speaking in the panel. We, we could relate to some of the things she was saying too. So that, that was definitely very difficult. It was hard to hear. Um, But at the same time, I think it was important just to show how real this issue is and how much it does affect everyone around the athlete. 
And I wanted to ask you about, you know, there is a reckoning in Canada right now, much like we had in the United States and is ongoing here. And I wanted to ask you if you wanted to make a comment on the investigations happening in Canada and what you think should happen. Yeah, so I definitely don't want to be saying too much about this because I am part of the Canadian national team still. And I just I don't want to be talking about this um, right now or yet with everything still fresh and going on. But and especially I'm not one thing that has kind of been nice, honestly, is that I am in a different country right now. I'm training with my coaches in the U.S. for most of the time doing my NCAA. So I'm not really a part of it right now. So I don't know everything that's going on. So I just I don't want to say false information or anything right now either. But I just think based on the things that I do know, it's very important for the people to be held accountable for their actions. And yeah, that's probably all I'm going to say right now. But I just think that's very important. And that applies to many different situations and things going on. But I just think that that's very important with some of the things coming out for sure. I think it's, um, it's, It's one thing, I think, for people to come out and, like, make a statement about what's happening, but I think you are demonstrating with your actions and your actions since you're 18 being on this um, safeguarding committee and applying for this, that this is really important and you're taking and making those steps to change. So, I just think that's huge and especially to do it while you're competing is amazing. So, I tip my hat to you. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely, I think it's important for sure. And I just, I know a lot about it. I know a lot of people that have gone through it and I just, I think it's very important to talk about things like this and just personally for me to be a part of groups like this. It means a lot to me. Well, thank you for your work on all of that. We'll be right back after this. Father's Day is coming up. If you want to give your dad or the father figure person in your life a unique and meaningful gift, check out StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. It is a thoughtful and meaningful gift that connects you to those who matter most. Every week, StoryWorth will email your loved one a thought-provoking question of your choice from their vast pool of options. These are questions you may never have thought of or had a chance to ask, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done in your life? Or what scared the crap out of you the most? I'm just adding, like, that's how I would interpret that question. If you could see the future, what would you want to find out? After one year, StoryWorth will compile your loved one's stories, including photos, into a beautiful keepsake book that you'll be able to share and revisit for generations to come. Fact Checker's family did this and gave each of the sons the book after it was done. And this is how we found out that Fact Checker's dad was in a flying club in high school where he used to walk on the wing of the plane in high school. This was a club that you could uh, be in. So yes, um, this is what he did in high school. And we would not have known this because who thinks to ask a question like this? Did you ever do anything crazy in high school? (laughs) Walk on the edge of a plane. Anyway, how can people enjoy this, Spencer? Give all the dads in your life a unique, meaningful gift you'll all cherish for years, StoryWorth. Right now, for a limited time, you'll save $10 on your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash gymcastic. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash gymcastic to save $10 on your first purchase. Storyworth.com slash gymcastic. So everyone, listen up. We have a lot of big meets coming up, and your support is the only way we'll be able to be there in person. Like last year, when at Worlds, which is kind of an important competition, I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, there was no way to watch podium training or qualifications. We were there with our headsets and our talking to each other every session with live blogs and videos and a podcast every day or like 2021 worlds when jessica when i didn't go because like you guys but jessica and kensley went and were the only media granted a visa uh for japan so a long way of saying uh we've been trying to figure out what to do with our commissioned episodes for a while now because you haven't been able to purchase one for like over a year um and we'll talk more about our updated plans in the future but in the meantime to thank Club Gymnard members who support us, we've decided to give away a commission to a random active Club Gymnard member in the month of June. So you need to do zero. 
No, nothing is required of you. You just have to make sure your membership is up to date. Um, each mem- club member has a unique subscription ID, and we're going to randomly select one of those numbers. And we'll do that selection at the end of June, and the winner will be announced in the first episode of July. And then we will reach out to the winner, and uh, you will have be able to commission an episode as the winner. Um, we have all of these meets coming up, so if you're not a member, now it's the time. If you're already a member, thank you, and we have more things planned in the thought in the thought areas of the head which is the top (laughs) a whole entire hour and a half episode on any topic you want and we're just giving that away to thank you guys so make sure your membership is up to date and we're back so let's go back to uh 2020 2021 Uh, the the whole let's go back to tokyo olympics so you become the alternate for Tokyo Olympics. And then after that, did you decide I'm done with elite? This is I've had it with this. Did you go out like I'm going to college? I'm never looking back. Or how how did you end that experience? Honestly, yes, that's almost exactly (laughs) how it went. Um, The year leading up to COVID was or the Olympics, I guess, with COVID was very hard. Mentally, physically, like training with just like two other people in the gym every day. That was very hard. And I just, I really wasn't enjoying it. There were other factors involved in that, but I really just wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And I was just ready to be done with elite gymnastics. I, I've heard so many amazing things about NCAA and I was just really looking forward to being a part of that, having that experience and just starting to love the sport again. And I guess one thing that's interesting to mention is that I was very honest about this with my NCAA coaches as well, before I even went to the before I even moved on campus, I was like, Hey, just so you know, I don't really like gymnastics right now. Um, I'm having a hard time just enjoying what I'm doing. I lost my passion, my love for the sport, but I do want to gain that back and I want to enjoy what I'm doing again. But just so you know, like (laughs) just a little heads up um, when I get started and they were super supportive. They're like, yeah, we got you. Like whatever you need, let us know. We'll give, we'll provide all the resources you need. Um, And especially Heather with her experience too, Mm -hmm. she understood exactly what I was saying. So they were ready to take on (laughs) all of that with me and super supportive from the start. So I I owe a lot to them for sure. My coaches here are amazing. And yeah, so I basically was like, I'm done with elite gymnastics. I'm just going to enjoy college. Um, I started all the college settings again, everything bars apart, bars higher, vaults at Mm -hmm. 130. Um, And I really enjoyed it. And it took a while, honestly, from the beginning, like there were some days before practice, like, this probably would have been September, October, I'd call Heather before practice, I'd be like crying. I'm like, I just can't get myself to go in today. Like, I really Mm -hmm. don't want to. She's like, it's okay, come in, you can sit and watch us train, like, just be a part of the team, just be in this environment. That's okay. So they were very welcoming and very um, opening, I guess, to how I was at the time. And just that whole Olympic experience, um, it was hard for me. Like that kind of situation is always hard. Being an alternate is never Mm -hmm. fun. So they understood where I was coming from and they made me, I guess those feelings and everything feel validated, which I think I needed at the time as well. So that's kind of how it went for a while. Once we got closer to probably December, right before our season started, I started getting really into it. Um, I started to understand more about what I was supposed to do in this season, how it worked, how NCAA gymnastics just worked. Cause I've never been to meet before anything until I got to there. Like I never, yeah, especially with COVID, like I never got to go experience gymnastics meet NCAA gymnastics meet in person. So I started to really realize you've never that seen like, a meet in person at all no, before. And you're already no. committed and at college. Oh my God. Oh. I know. I really didn't know what I was doing, like getting myself into. Cause I just, oh. I've seen some videos. I was like, Oh, this is really cool. This looks fun. But like, I've never experienced it. And then same with, I never got to tour the campus or anything. I never got a visit because of COVID. So I got that over FaceTime as well. The coaches would walk around campus be like, Hey, this is this, this is this. So I was like, yeah, I'll commit. It looks cool. Um, it seems like I would enjoy it. So that's kind of how that went. But yeah, once season started, I just, I loved it. Everyone was so supportive. I wasn't scared of making a mistake about what would happen to me if I did. Everyone was just so supportive. 
cheering you on no matter what happened. The celebrations at the end, I was not used to that at all. Like the team <laughs> running up to me and I was like, what? Like I was kind of <laughs> like hesitating and they're like, no, like, like, come on, celebrate. You can high five. You can have energy. It's okay. <laughs> so it, it, just, it took a lot of adjusting, but it was great. Um, especially the first meet. I didn't know that you did two events and then you fought or like, mm -hmm. it, it'd be like, Switch. yeah. So our first, I think our first meet was a away meet. So we started bars. So I started getting ready for beam. Heather's like, no, 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 we're on vault now. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like the first couple of meets took a bit of time. So I'd just go out to her after the event. I'd be like, Hey, what's, what's, what's the next event? <laughs> just so that I would make sure. Cause I just, I still didn't understand it. So I guess that first year was really getting used to the NCAA experience and just, I, I guess how it worked, but I loved it. By the end of it, I actually just loved what I was doing. I loved competing. I loved my team. I loved doing gymnastics. And I, like, I can't even remember the last time I felt like that since that first year of NCAA. So I think all of that was just, it was really important for me. And that's what helped me find my love for the sport again, just the people I was with and the supports that I was given since being here has been amazing. I feel like you've always been someone that has a really high hit percentage and that's continued. Is that true? Or am I making that yeah. up? Yeah. So last year I only fell once. Um, I don't remember how many routines we did last year. It probably would have been close to 40. So I guess nine, this year was 48. <laughs> yeah. This year was 48 routines and last year, Maybe it was 44 out of 44 routines. I don't know. So last year I fell once. This year I didn't fall any time. So that That's was crazy. huge. That was 48 out of 48 routines. I think it's just, yeah, doing routines over and over again. You just gain that experience and that confidence. And that's definitely helped me with my elite routines as well. I would say like just trusting yourself going into the routine, even if it's like even at Worlds, for example, my, my B routine in that team final, I was shaky for sure. But I knew I wasn't going to fall. <laughs> I was like, mm -hmm. I was like, I know I feel like very shaky. Like I was shaking like crazy. I think Jessica was doing her floor routine at the same time as me from Great Britain. And so we were competing so in England. So it was so loud. The music was loud. The crowd was loud. And I was just trying to tune in as much as I can. I was like, hey, I know I'm not going to fall. This might not be pretty, but I know I'm not going to fall. And I stayed on. And I think that, that was definitely very important for us. So. Definitely that experience from NCAA has helped with my elite gymnastics. How did you, I can't remember if I asked you about the water on the beam at Worlds. Yes. Did you notice it at the time or did you guys know? I know Ellie I was chronicling didn't. the entire roof fix afterwards, but. Yeah, I didn't, but I think it was Ellie that said something about it. But I think I went first up. I think, yes, I did go first up. I was a lead up. And I was not paying attention to that. I had so many other things to worry about. But um, she did say something about that. I'm pretty sure it was Ellie. Um, she's like, yeah, something on the beam. There's something on the beam. And I was like, oh, like maybe it's just a sparkle or something that fell off that's like shiny a little bit or something. Um, oh, God. It was so yeah. wet. It was shiny. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, my palms are sweating already for you guys. And I know it was like a year ago, but I'm still nervous for yeah. you. Yeah. No, I honestly, I don't know how I didn't realize, but I know people did. Um, yeah. That's why your hit percentage is so good. You're like sparkles, <laughs> waterfall. It doesn't matter. Because yeah. like when I talked to Jade Carey, she's like, yeah, I was about to do my front aerial and it dripped right in front of my face. And she was like, hmm, what's that? And front aerial. Oh, yeah. 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 I didn't have that. I was probably just not thinking about that, honestly. But yeah, that's crazy that that happened for sure. I wanted to ask you, speaking of unusual situations, so you ended up coming to Worlds, making the team, but you didn't have your college coach and you didn't have your club coach with you. You brought a totally different coach with you. Can you yes. tell us how that all happened? Yes. So I'll go into this whole situation kind yes. of a little bit. So some backup information. Um, I was supposed to go to World Trials. And then two days before, so I was starting to feel sick that week. So I was like, ah, it's probably fine. And then two days before we were supposed to leave, I actually saw the doctor and like, cause I was really sick and he got tested for mono and that came out positive oh, no. and I tested positive for strep. So I had mono and strep and this was two days before I was supposed to go to trials for worlds. 
So I didn't end up going. I wasn't allowed to get on the plane. I wasn't allowed to be around anyone. Like, and I was so sick. Like I've never been that sick ever in my life. So that was really hard for me because coming off of Commonwealth Games, I felt like I had a pretty good chance at making the team, honestly. So I, and I was feeling really good going into trials too. Like my routines were looking really good. I was feeling really confident. So once that happened, I was really upset and that was really hard for me, but I petitioned my routines um, and they named me second alternate. So I wasn't even traveling alternate. Um, So that was also hard. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having to take four weeks off gymnastics. I wasn't allowed to go upside down or anything because something to do with my spleen was enlarged or something. And I wasn't allowed to get cleared until these ultrasounds showed that my spleen was like the proper size. So I had to do three ultrasounds like once every week or every, yeah, I think it's about after two weeks of being sick, it was once every week. So I think it took about five weeks until I got cleared and my spleen was the proper size. So it took about five weeks until I was actually cleared from right before trials. And I was, I was doing no gymnastics by the end of it. I think the last two weeks of that, I was able to do some workouts. Like I was able to go in the weight room and do a little bit, just like no running, no jumping, nothing like that. So I was doing a little bit, I guess, but then I started training and I was like, okay, I'm non-traveling alternate. What are the chances that they're actually going to need me to compete? I'm just going to work my NCAA stuff because we have an inner squad in a couple weeks. So might as well. So I started with the bars out again, like back to my NCAA settings. And then, so I was going on for about a week. So I started doing my skills again. I was doing like a, a little bit of my releases. Like I was getting my stuff back. And then they called me and they said how Rose was hurt. And then they did a mistake in the calculations and I actually should be the traveling alternate. So that means that would put me on the team. So all of that was really confusing because I was like, wait, what? Like, I thought I had absolutely no chance. And all of a sudden they told me that I'm on the team. Like I wasn't even put to traveling alternate. They're like, no, no, you're on the team. I was like, what? Okay. Um, well, I didn't tell them that I haven't been training for that long because I don't think they would want to hear that. So no. I was like, okay, yeah, no problem. That's fine. And so I had to week, I had to leave about a week, a week and a half after they told me. So then I had to put all the bars back in. I had to go back at the normal vault setting and I had to get my skills and my routines back. So I had about a week and a half to get my routines back together after I had like four weeks off gymnastics and I was like super sick. So that was all, all over the place. I didn't even know what was happening at the time. I was just doing my routines, trying to do my routines. It was hard because I was coming back from taking so much time off. But I mean, I guess I was motivated because I was like, I'm about to go to world. So this is cool. Yeah. But that whole experience was crazy. And then I had to find out like, I mean, my NCAA can't, coaches can't go with me. I don't have a club coach back home. That's on the national, like that's considered national team coach, like a level four coach. So I was like, well, I guess I can go without a coach. And then just for fun, I was like, I was talking to Dennis because Dennis has gone every competition with me except Commonwealth Games. Um, so I was like, hey, what are you doing next week or like in two weeks? Um, and I like he knew about the whole situation. I was like, well, do you want to go to Worlds with me? Like, I didn't think he was really going to say yes. Like, I was like, might as well ask. This is my um, the last person I would ask. And then I'd just go without a coach. So I was like, and then he's like, yeah, let me see what I can do with my work schedule. Like, I'd love to go kind of thing. So that's how that happened. I ended up going with Dennis. And that meant that was really special because he has gone to every international meet with me, basically, like ever since my first one back in 2017. So that was really nice. And he knows me very well. Um, he knows how to coach me and everything. So that nothing like that was an issue. And he's just a really good person, and a really good coach. And so, yeah. I really enjoyed that. I'm glad he was able to go with me and I was able to have a coach with me there. So that whole, yeah, that whole experience, honestly, leading up to worlds was so chaotic and I was supposed to go, even though I was so, yeah, they said that I, I was a non-traveling alternate. I was like, okay, it's fine. I'm going to do this conference anyways. Like, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Might as well win a medal while I'm there, you know, (laughs) casual. Yeah. So like, I wasn't even, I wasn't even supposed to go. And then I was like, well, I'm going anyways, just to speak at this conference. So it's fine if I'm non traveling alternate, like I'll be there anyways. And then like they had my flights and everything for me just to speak at this conference. And then I had to tell them, be like, Hey, so I'm on the team now I'm going to worlds. Like, 
it was it was chaos but it was a really cool experience i'll have to say that (laughs) and just like to give the reason that i asked about dennis specifically is because basically he was a tumbling and trampoline world champion i think yeah world yeah world champion and then he was a like tumbling and floor vault coach for a long time and then um but he wasn't currently coaching at this time like no he he actually wasn't at all yeah he was he left coaching coaching. (laughs) (laughs) and then you were like uh come back (laughs) i was like um i kind of need you and yeah (laughs) He's like, you're lucky. I like you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I'm so grateful he was able to go with me because we had a really good time. And that was a country that we haven't been to together yet. So that was cool because we've gone what? to every continent together now for a meet, except for Antarctica. Oh, no, except for um, Africa. Also, we need to oh, go to Africa. Oh, well, now you need to go to Africa. Yeah, I know. We've been talking about that for a long time. Cairo World Cup. I what so you were like I'm done with the lead I'm totally burnt out your coaches let you slowly come back at Nebraska Heather Brink of course totally understanding how this is as a former yeah. elite and then you started enjoying college what made you decide to submit your teens to Canada and be like hey maybe <laughs> I'll do this thing so honestly my goal was to just go to Canadian championships and I wanted to like I felt like I owed myself a routine or a meet I guess that I competed those routines because I wanted to do it and I enjoyed to do it so I really wanted to just bring that elite or that college experience and that I guess vibe of competing that way to my elite gymnastics and I just wanted to do that once like I wanted to be like hey this is going to be my last meet I want to end it on a high note and I want to do it for myself and I don't want to have that fear of anyone else like being upset if I fall or anything I just want to do it all for myself because I felt like I owed that to myself after my whole, everything that I've gone through within my elite career, I guess. So, and then after that, I think I was fourth at nationals because I wasn't really like saying that I want to make any meets. Like I just was like, I'm here, I'm going to do this kind of thing. I didn't really say what my goals were to them. Um, so they were like, well, if you want to go, like you qualified for it. So I was like, yeah, I mean, might as well. And then I kind of tried to bring that same mindset, honestly to an international meet because I was like okay same thing like this could be my last international meet I'll just try and end it on a good note just do it for me enjoy myself like I haven't done that in an international meet like that kind of way I guess because there's always been that extra pressure that extra stress from coaches or just other people that made me doubt myself and just didn't enjoy it so Mm -hmm. I was like hey let's this is a cool competition I get to stay in an athlete's village we get some cool gear lots of cool athletes that I was competing against and just the crowd there was amazing. Everyone was so supportive. That competition ended up going really well. I had a bunch of career highs. Um, And I I think honestly, it's because I was just enjoying myself and I was in the moment and I had that experience from my NCAA competitions. And I was like, yeah, I just had that extra confidence because I knew that I could hit my routines, even though I was tired, even though I was just traveling, like all of these extra things that I've learned through competing NCAA helped me during that meet. And I just, I had a really good competition. I was really happy and I was really proud of how I did. And I remember walking out to the podium. I think it was when I was third all around. Like I did not see that coming at all. If I'm being honest, like I was just one thing at a time, one routine, one event at a time. Like I was really just doing it for me and I was just trying to enjoy and take in that whole experience. And it just, it went so well for me. And I was walking out to the podium and I was just like, wow, I can't believe I did this. Like, I just, I did it because I wanted to do it. I did it for myself. And I think that that was just so important for me to kind of have that result come out of me competing that way because I never had it like that before. Like, I just completely did it because I wanted to enjoy it and I wanted to do it in like a, in prepare in a safe and proper way. Mm. So just proving to myself that I could do that was huge for me. Did you have any culture shock going into, I mean, Nebraska is like one of those schools that it is like the town is the school and it's huge and it's a sports school. And like, it's, I don't think, I think it's hard for people to get from other countries how big these schools are and how they're like everything. Like, how did you deal with shocking to a surprising to you going into that? Um. Yeah, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into, honestly. (laughs) Like, college sports in the U.S. are crazy. Like, I went to my first football game, and I was like, I felt like I was in a movie the whole time. I was like, this is actually real? Like, I thought it was just like this in a movie. Like, (laughs) it was crazy. There was the band, the cheerleaders, and, like, people were coming out. There was, like, the halftime 
performance, whatever that is. Yeah. Like, there was so much going on. And I just kept taking videos and I was sending it to my family. I was like, look what's going on. Like, <laughs> this is real life. <laughs> so that was crazy. And then I went to like a volleyball game and it's just, it's like that with every sport. Like the fans are crazy. Everyone's just so committed and involved. And it's just, it was unreal. Honestly, it just didn't feel real for a while. And I want to ask you the most important question, college versus elite, which banquet slash parties are the best? Um, honestly, that's really hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's really hard because it's, it's different people, um, different countries different different people from different countries there's a lot that goes into answering this um so i'll say this right now i don't party very much in college i mean last year when i got here as a freshman it was a lot more intriguing because i'd never really done that before but now i've kind of mellowed out i guess a little bit so i love going to country concerts that's something that i really enjoy to do here and there's this like line dancing place here i do that quite often too uh, with some friends, we'll go line dancing and listening to the live music there. And then, yeah, I mean, after meets in <laughs> at World Cups and elite competitions, the banquets are usually pretty fun. The one after Worlds was really cool. They had like, um, like kind of pop up shops inside this building with food stands from like food trucks from different like countries, I guess. And that's cool. There were like. There was live music, there was a stage, and there were people dancing at the stage. There was, I don't even know how to, it wasn't like a bouncy castle, but it was like like a fun house. I don't know how to, what to call it, but. That's awesome. <laughs> they had things like that with like mirrors that were like, made things look weird and like slides to go down. Like they had so many cool things in there. Um, so the way that they do some of those banquets are really fun. And then usually the athletes all go out together afterwards and that's really fun. So it's just two different things. And like one thing that I really enjoy about the college parties, I guess would be just seeing other people from different sports that we have like an international student support group and we get together every month and we meet. International group must be so helpful just for stuff like banking and like, how do you get in line and what card do you use and like setting up your mail and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. And just sharing um, experiences that we've gone through, like, but you need help. You got to get out your problems. Yeah. We just talk about like stupid things Americans have said to us. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Um, so like, I'd like to apologize on behalf of America (laughs) uh, to you. Like what do people say? Well, I don't get that many crazy things, but my one friend from South Africa, like people ask if he has a roof over his head at his house, if he has running water, like, do you have internet? Like just so many questions like that. And he's just like, I think they're serious too. Like my Italian teammate, like someone in her class asked if like the whole country is underwater and she's just like, what? What? (laughs) Like there's just so many questions that you're just like, wait, what? Like, are you being serious? So we like, like to vent about stuff like that because it's just entertaining and funny, honestly. But sometimes it's like, wow, they actually think that. <laughs> and this is why we're glad they're in college. Go to college. Yeah, kids so you can learn things like Italy isn't Atlantis. It's yeah. above ground. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad you have that because I know so many international students can relate or just other Americans who are like, how did this? Yeah. Yep. You're getting the full American experience there. Yes, for sure. <laughs> but, but it's good. I love it. Worlds this year, Paris Olympics, still oh, keeping it in mind? yeah. Okay, so yeah, now, um, I mean, after coming off of Worlds and just how that whole experience went, I think I'm trying for 2024 now. Um, I'm in a good place mentally and physically. So, uh, yeah, I'm like, might as well try it, honestly, just so that I have no regrets afterwards. But I'm going to be training here and I'm going to be with my team because this is just the best environment for me to be in to be able to compete at my best. So um, I'll be training here. I'll be competing in CAA, but I'll also be trying for the 2024 Olympics next year as well. So I'll go to trials and all that. And then, yeah, for this fall, I'm thinking either Worlds or Pan Am Games. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really enjoyed Commonwealth Games. I love those and those games experience, I guess. And I've been to Youth Olympic Games now too. So if I can add uh, Pan Am Games to that, Um, that would be really cool too. So I think I'm going to work towards that. Thank you so much to Emma for being with us and sharing those stories. I will always think of Watanabe 
<laughs> Watanabe in a new, and I really take the whole like him talking about family in a whole new way after he has after these stories. So I love it. Thank you so much, Emma. Some people just like to give us no strings attached money. They don't want to bother with joining Club Jim Nerd, and so they just donate. You can find our donate button for a no strings attached donation at the bottom of the club page at gymcastic.com forward slash club. Now let's talk about Japan picking their team 150 years too early. So, which they always do. So, but it seems to work out for them on the men's side. On the women's side, though, I mean, they're kicking ass. So this might be a good sign, but I, I have problems with what's happening. So let's talk about the overall first. Okay. Yes. So uh, this past weekend was NHK, which is the second event in Japan's world team selection procedure. So for the women this year, four of the five spots on the team, I'm already having like a stress, stress nightmare about this. Four of the top five spot, four of the five spots on the team are decided by the all around standings at the end of NHK. So we already know who four of the five members of the team are, and it's solely based on the all around. It's Tom Forster's dream. He would, he, he would love Japan's selection procedures. So the thing is, automatically selecting that many all arounders is often strategically dumb. It's also super exciting. <laughs> like I was up in the middle of the night with a glass of wine and a VPN texting Jessica, knowing she wasn't watching, but I was like, I need I you to be watching watch. this with me. <laughs> I, uh, I got my tunnel bear fired up and I couldn't get that freaking thing off the screen. Why was there some message that was this oh, big? Yeah. Taking up I'm half sure the screen? that there was a message taking up half the screen that I was like, I'm deciding not to translate this because I'm sure it's like, you are stealing something and you're a horrible person. Don't do this. But I was like, mm, plausible deniability. I'm just going to keep watching because I don't understand what this message says. And I can see some of it. A VPN is a it should be a legal license to watch, by the way. But anywho, <laughs> that's what I tell myself. Anyway, it was super exciting because so combined all around standings from the two days of all japan nationals and any the one day of nhk decide the final all around standings who makes the worlds for the all around world beam champion watanabe from 2022 came in as the all around leader after all japan but everyone was really close and then watanabe immediately fell on her upgraded yurchenko one and a half on vault to start the meet and fell way down and it was just chaos from there because it was like the leader is now like at risk of not advancing and this person's up here and this person's standing it was like the eurovision jury results all over again these standings <laughs> moving around so she did end up by the skin of her teeth hanging on for the fourth and final automatic spot on the world's team so we will be seeing the defending world beam champion at worlds the next year which doesn't always happen japan uh so she <sighs> held on by two it. tenths ahead of hatakeda chiaki the younger sister of hitomi who made a number of teams in the past quad for japan and was one of their top athletes we ultimately winning the all-around and getting a spot was miata who I would say is the top all-arounder in Japan. When everyone's healthy and competing their full difficulty, she was so important for them at Worlds last year with her really strong Yurchenko double full, with her super solid beam that ultimately won the bronze medal in the event final. And we were kind of like, that could have won. And Watanabe was also like, I kind of think my teammate could have won. I mean, I'm happy I won, but like Miata could have won this. And, you know, it was a sentiment shared by a lot of us that she could have been very well, could have been world beam champion with the routine she showed in Liverpool last year. She was super injured this year. Like there was a Ugh. fractured heel. A fractured there was an heel. ankle problem. Can I just pause for a moment to talk about anybody yeah. out there who's had a fractured heel or a heel bruise? It is so painful so painful because like everything attaches right there you think about your achilles tear like imagine all the attachment on the bottom of your foot all the things that attach there it's 
ow, 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 ow. Just thinking about coming back early to do like beam routines. And she did, wasn't even wearing one of those giant things like Coupettes used to wear on her heel for beam. One of those like, you know, it's like basically a doorstop, but you put it it's in a sleeve for your foot. Remember that thing Coupettes used to wear? <laughs> door stop it's like a, it's, yes that's a really a, accurate description right it's a plastic <laughs> wedge that you wear on your foot so oh uh, okay go on now that my hurt my heel yeah. hurts so this was stressing us out a lot basically these injuries because there's so much pressure th- because of these selection procedures to compete the all around at nhk because we were having my murakami 2019 flashbacks when she was too injured to compete at nhk so she didn't have the full all around score and then they didn't put her on the world's team and you know we've talked about it one million times in the show and we will continue to because we're not over it and it was horrible so we were really worried about this because there's like you have to compete at nhk everyone knows that you have to compete the all around and uh she was super injured but she got through it great hit best hit of the day Won the all around. Don't know how she did it, but she did it. Uh, second all around was Kishi Rina, who is new. We haven't really seen much of her before. Best Yurchenko double full, best floor tumbling of the gang. They really need her, and it was exciting to see her come through. Also, Fukasawa automatically made the world's team. So she was the one, remember last year, who got the last minute specialist spot. Be- instead of Ashikawa, who was then the defending world beam champion, because Fukusawa's bars was so high scoring and they needed that bars routine. And she was hitting like every routine domestically, 14 here, 14 there, 14, 14, 14. It was like, you can't not take this. She adds more to the team score. And then she really won a place in our hearts because her big moment came at Worlds in the team final, her bars routine that she was on the team for. And she fell like 9,000 times and got a nine. And we were like, okay, now I identify with you. I understand. And I am emotionally connected to this routine because any gymnast who like has their big moment on an event they're great at and then falls a bunch of times is forever ours because we understand we can go back to kokoro in a minute but i want to talk about the fact that speaking of your feelings about uh this selection process we, we always feel like it's way too early but the thing i like about it is that you have to be consistent and then you get to rest which is nice but i like that there's a series so you have to be consistent but um I do want to mention that on behind the scenes this week, we talked about how in Eurovision, they should have the same kind of judging announcements. So there should be a celebrity behind each, a celebrity from that country behind each of the judges who dramatically stands up in sequence and screams the score that that judge Mm -hmm. gave to the gymnast. So Mm -hmm. FIG, if you're listening, this is our new request or Japan, you know, whoever does it first. So on the topic of Ashikawa, I'm so glad you brought her up because there's one spot left on Japan's world's team. So Miata, Kishi, Fukasawa, Watanabe, automatically there. At this point, the person with the best scoring argument, and it's all done by scores and how you know, the average of two scores at this thing, the person with the best scores right now to fill out that team would be Ashikawa. Her beam scores so far this year have been very strong. She would currently add the most to the team score. They still have to compete at event nationals, so that's not done yet. But I, at this point, like her chances to make the world's team this year. She dramatically did not make it last year because she didn't add as much to the team score as Fukasawa. Jessica was very upset about it. We were all very upset about it because she's the 2021 world beam champion. Jessica was so upset that she kept inventing scenarios in which Ashikawa (laughs) would suddenly and dramatically be whisked onto the team and then happened to start believing they were real. (laughs) These are things that happen. Um, But this gives us the potential for Japan to have two World Beam champions and three World Beam medalists on the same Worlds team this year. Ashikawa is a World Beam champion. Watanabe is a World Beam champion. Miata is a World Beam medalist. And I do, as much as this all-around strategy is stressing me out, I do like that it's kind of accidentally ending up to be an all-beam, no-regrets team. Yes! Where it's just beam specialists and we forget about all the other events. We're just It's all beam. It's just beam is the event and this is what we're doing. And I do enjoy that. I like, I love a team who's like, you know, you other countries can have their vault, you know, everybody vaults and you're one point up per vault on the other teams. And Japan's like, we will win, we'll be one point up on every single B routine. You're welcome. 
Uh, just like when, <laughs> when like um, Italy goes on bars, you're like, oh, those scores. Mm-hmm. If they stay on. One hopes. <laughs> One, yeah. <laughs> um, so what, what's stressing me out, though, is the absence of Sakaguchi in this conversation. So Sakaguchi mm. was on Japan's world team last year. We really enjoyed her floor routine, her floor performance, her exciting tumbling. It was kind of an athletic, active style floor performance. We loved it. She had a really good Yurchenko double full. She's not in the group this year. Her fault scores were a little lower. She's not in the top of the all around standings. She's behind in the race for the event spot. I'm quite concerned that we're not going to see her just because she's my favorite, but also because I think they need that vault and floor, and I think they will miss having it at Worlds because the selective process was too focused on the all-around. Mm. Facts. Also, event na- so event nationals is still decide is still to be decided, kind of the final spots. This is also to talk about men for a second. Event mm. nationals coming up yes. next month is also going to be the shot for Minami, Minami to make the men's team, which is still live as a distinct possibility. Minami, you will remember, is the one with the tumbling. Like if you happen on social media to have seen someone share, like someone did a quinceptuple triple bubble. Oh, it was Minami. That's that's who that is. The most insane tumbling ever. Three and a half twist. Three and a half twisting double tuck this year. And then he'll do something like a triple double and a two and a half out of it to a front tuck, like practically off the floor. He's everything you thought was impossible on floor. He can do. That's who he is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't talked about Canadian championships, which happened, but you wouldn't <laughs> know would they it? happened. I, I, no. I, I am so <laughs> pissed for the athletes about how this was handled. And I understand that Canada is in their dumpster fire years and everything will be torn down and they will rebuild better, hopefully. This was such an insult to the athletes. This is their national championships, and this is how it was handled. Basically, someone stuck an iPhone had, on the ceiling, and that was it. A had strength. very like the parents put together a bake sale vibe <laughs> to this championship, <laughs> right? It did. We were we were lucky to have kind of a mounted camera in the corner of this high school gym. At the Richmond Olympic <laughs> Oval, where this meet was. But, like, bars was super far away. Like, yeah. there were some ants doing bars next to people literally doing rock climbing during this competition. Like, someone would just go up on the rock wall during an important <laughs> bars routine. And I was like, what, what, is, what is this, Canada? Not to mention, they didn't even acknowledge the historic achievement of the women winning their first team medal in... They're bronze at Worlds. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, the minimum. Just do the minimum. Have them line up, stand there, and be like, you guys are amazing. Because they're all there, even if they couldn't all compete. Like, Emma Spence coming back from an injury was there, but couldn't compete. <sighs> um, a yeah. plaque? A round of applause? A, Anything? a salad bowl? Like, Simone got that one time? Just call Simone and be like... You know, you probably have a storage unit full of all those dumb salad bowls that they would give you for being the best gymnast. Can we have, like, five to six of them for a reason? She'd be like, fine. Yeah. Yeah, she would Look, Ellie, I'll give Ellie a salad bowl. Tell me when and where. <laughs> what gymnast wouldn't give Ellie Black a salad bowl? That's what Everyone. I want to know. She deserves all the salad bowls. So Arlie Tran won the all-around title at Canadian Nationals. She is on the Pan Ams team, so hopefully we will be able to see her closer up. Um, But from the far away, her bars looked beautiful. I'm very excited about her bars. Legs together. She got like an 8-6 execution score on bars on the first day, which you kind of don't get on bars. Like, no one got higher than 8-4. So maybe unrealistic, but also lovely form. Um, Ava Stewart, who placed second in the gallery round. She was on the Olympic team. Um, Jenna Lalonde got third. A lot of the top uh, Canadians competed a little bit or didn't compete. As Jessica mentioned, Emma Spence didn't compete. Ellie Black was there, competed bars. Doesn't really have to do a lot because it's Ellie Black. Like, 
good here have up take a bars routine it's amazing on the second day that's that's what you get like shallon olsen also she cameoed in your chenko fall it was like i'm shallon olsen I don't, i'm just gonna just like all right have fun yeah Can i'm gonna wave my hand fall. here's here's your new chenko fall you're call welcome. me when it matters I have to prioritize. I only compete gymnastics 900 months a year with no stopping and all of the world's teams and whole NCAA seasons uh, back to back to back to back. And no one ever says anything about it. And then it's like, <gasps> Jade Carey might try for the Olympics and Oregon State at the same time. And Shallon's like, okay, I've been doing that for like 20 years. <laughs> no one batted an eye, but now Jade's doing it. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> So anyway, Ali and Shallon were there. They cameoed a routine. Um, so, you know, I'm okay with it. But also the national championships do count for some of the remaining spots for automatic all-arounders. They're just going to be weighted less than uh, the tri- the world's trials, which are going to be in August. So that's the real that's the real one for watching you know, the, the non-Ali Black spots on the world's team. Uh, but um, but nationals does count, so that's a big deal for people like Tran and Stewart and Lalonde because they have uh, chipped away at the at what they need to do at least a little bit in order to uh, make worlds. I want to get to some gym internet news. Uh, first of all, the FIG is no longer pushing for Olympic inclusion, according to Inside the Game. So you know how parkour, for parkour. is kind of parkour. What did I say? You just said the FIG wasn't pushing for Olympic (laughs) inclusion. Like we were talking about artistic (laughs) gymnastics and I was like, that sounds wrong. (laughs) Parkour. Yeah. So parkour is always, you know, it's like break dancing and skateboarding and they're like, we don't need you, but like whatever. So basically Watanabe says um, that it's not their aim. Uh, Instead, he likens it to soccer where the World Cup is the pinnacle. And obviously the Olympics is not the pinnacle for parkour. It'd be nice, but then they're not going to like spend all their energy on it. Um, In the meantime, you think this is the FIG saying, oh, we've made a huge mistake and we shouldn't have tried to mess with parkour in the first place? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. It might be. But it might just be like, why are we trying so hard when there's no, it's not going to happen. Because we're not at the level of skateboarding and snowboarding. And that might be why. When they get to that level that much money, then they're really going to want them in. Um, did you see Brody's, uh, Brody Malone, uh, did you see his x-rays and his post on Instagram? I did not. But I'm excited oh. to if you are a... Um visual listener because we're looking at some stuff right now we're not going to show you all the posts because then you guys will be like injuries i'm triggered but i'm going to describe them so you remember we (laughs) talked (laughs) we're going to vividly describe them (laughs) i'm going to vividly describe them so brody malone uh he says that he's you know going to be back spring of 2024 he's gonna be ready to go to paris so um we talked about this originally when his injury happened back in mid-March. So it's only been, you know, a month and a half, two months since this injury. He peeled on his dismount uh, in Germany at a meet, missed his landing. And when he landed, it looked like his knee completely hyperextended. So his knee bent the wrong direction, 90 degrees and sideways at the same time. So he posted uh, photos of the external fixator that he had on his leg and, and his shin. So it's like from your thigh to your to his um what's it called to your shin he has Hmm. uh like pins through the legs sticking out of his leg with a bar between them um so he posted those and then x-rays of the many many pins he has through his tibia or like the bottom of his knee joint um he said he has yet another surgery coming up he said several um pcl gone mcl gone uh in addition to the fracture of his tibia um so what my question for you is, considering the video we just mm-hmm. watched of him doing yeah. giants on high bar over the pit, <clears throat> if you had suffered this injury and had yet another <laughs> surgery Would I have quit? Up, yes, obviously. I think we've established that I do not have the interest in anything to continue through pain. So you had to go through all that to get your bone to heal. Then you have a, you still don't have any ligaments. Would you be doing giants on high bar over the pit? 
in a leg brace? I don't know. No. No. I was like, get off the bar! Someone stop him! It, I just feel like this is my problem with uh, the Ben's program sometime. Is I'm like, someone should have blocked his path to the high bar and not let him do giants. And I know giants on high bar for him are like, you know, doing a cartwheel. It's so easy. But it's just not worth the risk. It's just not worth the risk. That is my opinion about it. So, anyway. Um, but he should be able to get back by Paris in no time. Like, that's totally achievable. People have come back from this. It's, you know, as long as all his surgeries go well, he should be able to come back. And as long as he gets off high bar. <sighs> Brody, please take care of yourself. Um, okay. <clears throat> Couple things. Um, in dumpster fire news, let's talk about this. Okay. So um, we have a 20-year sentence for Darren Frank McCoy. He was a gymnast and cheerleading coach in Texas and Alabama. Um, he has pleaded guilty to um, CP, and he has 20 years in prison. He was a coach at Metroplex uh, Gymnastics and Swim in Allen, Texas, and previously coached at Top Dog Cheer in Montgomery, Alabama. So another person gym hopping, just like coaches country hop when they get in trouble uh the woodward coach has got sentenced so former gymnastics coach at woodward um nathaniel singer 27th of Ma 27 of massachusetts he was sentenced to two and a half to five years in state prison for assaulting a gymnast um and also we talked about the french investigation over abuse is uh in the works so the gymnast testified um, and it was public. And Vincent Pateau, the technical director of um, the French Gymnastics Center in Marseille, he was sentenced Thursday to six months in prison and fined 10,000 euros for aggravated moral harassment of three minors. I enjoy this sentence very much. This is excellent. I like moral harassment as a reason that coaches should go to jail. Jail. Jail, 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 prison, prison, prison. This is what, not just like, oh, you're banned. I would like to see more actual criminal punishment for this kind of stuff. Um, other happier news. Um, British Gymnastics, the chairman of British Gymnastics has called for the government to establish an independent safeguarding, bo safeguarding body for all sports. That's good. Also, Savannah Schoenherr has transferred to LSU and things that we never thought we'd be saying that happened. Uh, Lucy Stanhope transferred to Nebraska. Uh, Jade is saying she's staying in Oregon to train. Simone is married and her uh, husband is going to Green Bay to play the footballs. But it seems like from all of her posts about crying hysterically that she's staying in Texas. So that's promising news for Simone uh, and Simone training possible comeback news. Aja D'Amato uh, is going to miss Worlds this year because um, she has an ACL and a meniscus tear. Mm -hmm. Additionally, <clears throat> good news is that gymnastics... Find some good news, Sam. You don't want to end on has... <laughs> Asia D'Amato's injury? Right. Uh, so you remember how the European um, European gymnastics was like, we can't have gymnastics at the European Games because Poland doesn't have a venue that works for mm. gymnastics. Well, now, according to Inside the Games, um, the European Olympic Committee is working towards bringing gymnastics back. So hopefully this will happen. Also, Japan donating more and more stuff. Remember they donated the stuff to the Philippines um, where Carlos Yulo comes from. The embassy of Japan donated equipment to the gymnastics association of Bosnia. Yay. It's lovely. If you would like to support the show, please do so by joining club gym nerd. Uh, and you can get, you get a whole extra podcast every single week, every Friday. You could ask us questions live, or you can listen to it in your favorite podcast player, Noon Pacific on Fridays. You have behind the scenes and it's like a little, a little dirtier than the regular show, a, a little less filtered, I would say, mostly on my part, not so much on Spencer's, but yeah. Um, and please enter, make sure that your membership is up to snuff, up to date, is in good standing for Club Gym Nerd so that you can be entered to win our next commission podcast, the whole entire episode on any topic you want. We are having a lottery and auctioning those off. So um, until next week, until Friday at Behind the Scenes, uh, remember to take up on gay, split on rights, and 
Thank you for listening. We'll see you on Friday. This show is created, executive produced, produced, edited, audio engineered, and published by me, Jessica Oburn. Managing editor in charge of show notes, podcast content, and wrangling over enthusiasm is Spencer Barnes. Our news editor is Uncle Tim of gymnastics-history.com. And customer service IT, Gymternet News, and additional production services are provided by Steve Cooper, a.k.a. Fact Check. She did get, <laughs> wait, Ashikawa. I'm talking about no, Ashikawa. Fukusawa. I'm Ashikawa talking about Ashikawa.